Happy Sunday, everyone. Hope you're doing great. Title of today's musing is Four Scriptures Most Mormons Ignore. And yes, I continue to prefer that shorthand because typing four scriptures most members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ignore uh, is a lot. So there we are. These scriptures that I'm going to talk about are all interrelated. And the topic, actually, I thought about kind of three different approaches to discussing this today or even breaking them up across different uh, little episodes or musings here. But I've instead decided to pack them all into one, into a kind of a briefer summary or discussion about these things rather than taking a much more protracted uh, approach to doing it. So the four scriptures, uh, as I said, are all interrelated, and I'm just going to step through them one at a time. So as we go, you'll see how they are interrelated, but we're going to start only with the first one. Now, these are, of course, my perspective on uh, scriptures that most people ignore, most members of our church. This is born of my experience, uh, sitting in a, you know, plenty of gospel doctrine classes, uh, being a missionary, being in different wards all over the place, um, and, uh, seeing what's in the official manuals and what we're instructed to teach and talk about. And so obviously this is born of my own experience. Um, but I, I feel fairly confident in, uh, in kind of, you know, uh, what do you call that? Extrapolating that to the broader membership of the church, because I don't think that my experience is, is somehow anomalous to the overall trends that we have. Okay. So the first scripture that most members of our church ignore, I think, in Connor's opinion, uh, first one is uh, doctrine and covenants 84. This is, uh, verses 54 through 58. This is a revela revelation received by Joseph Smith in 1832 at Kirtland. And a lot of this, uh, this section, this revelation is about, uh, the priesthood. And these, you know, a lot of them were missionaries. They were going around preaching. They're all gathered together. And Joseph, you know, gives this revelation that he received. And here's what it says. Your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you've treated lightly the things that you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion, even all, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments, which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. So here is, you know, only two years have gone by since uh, the formation of the church. This is a, a very new church comparatively still. And yet here is the founder of the church uh, referring to the missionaries, the elders, the, the children of Zion more broadly, basically all the members of the church saying that they are condemned. They have been impeded in their spiritual progress because of vanity and because of unbelief. And, and I talk in Christ versus Caesar about those two uh, issues, what vanity means and how unbelief relates. I'm not going to get into that here, but, uh, but he's saying vanity and unbelief, and those are related to what the solution is. They shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember Basically, the Book of Mormon, not just to not, not just to say you believe, not just to say you follow Christ, not just to say these things, but to do uh, according to that which I have written. So the Book of Mormon is the antidote. It is what they have treated lightly. They have treated light, treated lightly the things that they had received. They'd only had them for a little while, and they were already treating them lightly. And we remain under that condemnation today. That condemnation has never been lifted. In fact, I think it was Benson, uh, Ezra Tapp Benson, who once said, I think it was in the 80s when he was you know, talking about flooding the earth with the Book of Mormon, his goal at the time was very much to say, let's get out from under this condemnation. Uh, we need to take more seriously the things that we have received. We are under this condemnation today. So it's not changed. We still have this vanity and unbelief. Our minds, therefore, are still darkened. We like to think... Uh, of ourselves as spiritually enlightened or superior to, you know, our Christian counterparts in the heathen world or whatnot. Uh, but we are, we have our minds darkened because of unbelief because we have treated lightly the Book of Mormon. And you say, well, hang on, I read my Book of Mormon, you know, every day, or I, I go to Sunday school and we talk about the Book of Mormon. Well, yeah, well, so did they, right? So did they. 
and, and they were under condemnation. And so have, you know, members of the church in generations past, and they were under condemnation. So there's something else going on here. There's something far more substantive than just checking the box and reading the Book of Mormon. Again, not just to say, but to do according to that which I have written. And I'm not going to get into it uh, this week. I'll save it for another uh, musing. But I think a lot of that condemnation, the, the failure to remember, is connected to Ether 8, the commandment of, for the Lord, uh, from the Lord for us to you know, awake to our awful situation and to do something about it. And so they had treated uh, lightly the Book of Mormon. And, and so this is one of the scriptures I think that members of the church ignore. We don't talk about this very much. Uh, I remember when I was in BY, at BYU in like 2000, I want to say, uh, that's when President Hinckley challenged everyone to read the Book of Mormon before the next, I think, general conference. I think it was between conferences, if I remember right. So I remember being on campus and everyone's carrying their blue copy of the Book of Mormon with them. And you see people, you know, reading it between uh, classes or like everyone's taking this seriously. And uh, and so we have Ezra Taft Benson trying to flood the earth with the Book of Mormon. And we have Gordon B. Hinckley challenging us all to read it. I think uh, President Nelson, uh, you know, recently encouraged something similar a few years ago. And so uh, that, that's great. But but is that sufficient? Because reading it is and, and, and focusing on the spiritual benefits and the um, teachings of Jesus are one thing and a very important, if not the most important thing. But there is kind of the forgotten secondary focus and focal point of the Book of Mormon, which is kind of this warning manual about what we should not be doing, who we should not be supporting, that we need to come out of Babylon and not be in the church of the devil. And I'll talk in another musing about what that church of the devil uh, really means. Um, but, but it's not enough to just focus on the good stuff. We need to focus on what we're doing wrong because we have, uh, we, we have received all manner of unrighteousness. Well, uh, I was just reading this morning at church, that scripture, I think it's in DNC one. If I remember, I could be remembering that wrong, but it's talking about, uh, oh, it's in, was it fourth Nephi? Um, that's what it was. It was in fourth Nephi and it's talking about that there's all these like schisms happening and everything. And so here it is. This is 4th Nephi 1.27. It came to pass that when 210 years had passed away, there were many churches in the land. Yea, there were many churches which professed to know the Christ, and yet they did deny the more parts of the gospel, insomuch that they did receive all manner of wickedness. And so we like to read that and think, oh, that applies to all those other you know churches other than ours. I'm not entirely sure that that's true. And, and I think that those of us within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we deny the more parts of the gospel. We like to think that we have the restored gospel. We do not. We have a partially restored gospel, but we do not have capital the, capital restored, capital G gospel, right? We have some restoration. We do not have the restoration. And, and so I think we have denied more parts of the gospel we have denied ourselves it's not that, that that we're going out and like you know like peter denying christ or others we're not denying that these we're not claiming that things are bad or wrong we're denying ourselves the more parts of the gospel we're ignoring the more more parts of the gospel and i'll get into that in the second scripture that i think most members of our church ignore and so here are these people these these professed followers of christ denying the more parts of his gospel insomuch that they did receive all manner of wickedness. That's a very interesting way of saying it, to receive. It's like you're willingly receiving it. It's not, you're, you're not subjected to it. You're not, uh, it's not being forced upon it. You are receiving it. You're asking for it. You're embracing it. It's Elder Neil I. Maxwell talking about how we have one foot, uh, or no, what was it? His reference was having a summer cottage in Babylon, right? That we'd like to go visit from time to time. We've got one foot in and out of the kingdom, and so we're receiving all manner of wickedness. We ourselves, I talked uh, last week, I believe, about idolatry. I think this all very much applies. And therefore, DNC 84, we are under condemnation until we repent and remember the Book of Mormon, not just to say, but to do. And so we look around and, you know, it's like, oh, everything, you know, we we'll just read our Book of Mormon, be good people. That's not enough. We are condemned. Plenty of good 
scripture reading, temple going members of the church in generations uh, past did their best. They, or maybe, <laughs> we like to say we're doing our best, but are we? They, they checked boxes, they read their scriptures and so forth, but they were still under condemnation. And so are we. And so I guess my purpose for sharing this first scripture that most Mormons ignore is that we don't really talk about that at all. We're ignoring it. We can't fix it if we don't pay attention to it. It's like we're ignoring the leaky roof, thinking, pretending it just isn't leaky. You know, we're going to pay a price at some point. But we're completely ignoring, for those joining late, it's DNC 84, 54 through 58. And so I, I don't think we should <laughs> ignore that. I think we need to focus on, I mean, so I didn't read 58. Here's the final verse. So not only to say, but to do according to that which is written, that they may bring forth fruit, meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remaineth a scourge and judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion. That's the situation we're in. We like to think that, oh, Heavenly Father is so pleased with us and we're paying our tithing and we're, you know, going to the temple and yay, pat ourselves on the back. We're good Mormons. We're good Christians. And yet here it's talking about a judgment being poured out upon us because we are under condemnation and we are not repenting and remembering the new covenant. We're not doing what the Book of Mormon says. There's a lot of stuff in there that we're ignoring. We're focusing on the easy stuff. We're doing great at the easy stuff but we're conveniently not paying attention to some of the things that challenge us and some of the things that would be anti-cultural, counter-cultural. Why? Because we want to fit in. We want to be liked. We want everyone to like us. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to be outcasts and a peculiar people. So let's just not even talk about as a church some of these other things that would be too controversial. So that's scripture number one. And as I said, these are all interrelated. So scripture number two is not that far afield from what we're talking about. Third Nephi 26, seven through 11. This is about the sealed portion of the plates. It's really interesting talking to members of our church who had no clue that there are, there, there are, there were golden plates that Joseph Smith could not translate, that there was a sealed portion he was unable to access and translate and provide to us that he was forbidden, that there are scriptures out there that we don't even know about. So 3 Nephi 26, 7 through 11, this is um, Jesus talking. This is after, you know, during his visit to, to this continent. So 26, verse 7 through 11. Um, oh, and th this is, I guess, Mormon's summary. So I'll start in verse 6, because here's where Mormon is saying, now, there cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the things which Jesus did truly teach unto the people. So Mormon is here narrating. But behold, he says, the plates of Nephi do contain the more part of the things which he taught the people. And these things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people. And I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again unto this people from the Gentiles, that's us, or the Gentiles, according to the words which Jesus has spoken. So Mormon's saying, I'm, I'm writing down the lesser things so that the Gentiles can take it to, to my people in the future. And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, and if it shall so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them, unto their condemnation. There's that word again. Behold, I was about to write them, Mormon says, all of which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. So we've got lesser things and we've got greater things. And Mormon is here telling us that in his record, he is only providing us the lesser things, that the Lord wanted to try our faith not just faith in terms of belief, but faith in terms of obedience and action. Remember, not just to say, but to do, according to that which is written. So the Lord wanted to try our faith by giving us lesser things first. And if we would believe the lesser things, and again, belief implies action, behavioral change, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. Now, this is very related to Ether 4. 
so here is Moroni, Mormon's son. Mormon's dead. Moroni is adding the the book we call Ether, the Jaredite record, to the end of Mormon's uh, record. Okay, Mormon's compendium of his summary of all of these different Nephi records. So Mormon does this thing. He passes on. Here's Moroni with the Jaredite record. And he says, this is so important. We have to add this to my father's record. So here's Moroni now. And he says, so he's doing the whole Jaredite record. Behold, this is verse four, Ether 4, 4. Behold, I have written upon these plates the very things which the brother of Jared saw. And there never were greater things made manifest than those which were made manifest unto the brother of Jared. Wherefore, verse five, the Lord hath commanded me to write them, and I have written them. And he commanded me that I should seal them up. And he also commanded me that I should seal up the interpretation thereof. Wherefore, I have sealed up the interpreters according to the commandment of the Lord. For the Lord said unto me, they shall not go forth unto the Gentiles, that's us, until the day that they shall repent of their iniquity and become clean before the Lord. Verse 7 and in that day that they shall exercise faith in me, saith the Lord, even as the brother of Jared did, that they may become sanctified in me, then will I manifest unto them the things which the brother of Jared saw, even to the unfolding unto them all my revelations, saith Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are. And then here's what it says a few verses down. This is Jesus talking now. He says, Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, again, that's us, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of unbelief. Come unto me, O ye house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great the thing, how great things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundation of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. And then final verse. Behold, when ye shall rend that veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness, and hardness of heart and blindness of mind. Then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world come on uh, foundation of the world from you. Yea, when ye shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the Father has remembered the covenant which he made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. Okay, so all of this is saying that the brother of Jared had this amazing vision, like like a vision of all the things. And Mor Moroni is reading it, presumably Mor Mormon, his dad did as well, but Mor Moroni is reading it, he's blown away, he's like, we got to add this, and the Lord commanded him to write it, and so he wrote it, and then he was commanded to seal it up, and so he sealed it up. And denying access to Joseph Smith and the rest of us to this amazing vision, this amazing information and revelation because of unbelief, because it is considered some of the greater things, whereas we are to, uh, made to start only with the lesser things. And so in 3 Nephi 26, here's you know the Lord talking again, and he's talking about how there's the lesser things, and they're going to be brought from the Gentiles, right? And when they receive this, we're going to try their faith to see if they're going to get the greater things or not. So again, Sure, we all read the Book of Mormon, great, we read through this, and maybe we you know, have a minute of conversation about it as we move on to the next chapter in 27, but we don't really pay it much attention. We don't talk about the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Cleon Skousen had this great essay decades ago called, uh, it was called, Do You Really Want the Rest of the Book of Mormon? And he goes over a lot of this stuff in there. Do you really want the rest of the Book of Mormon? And he, so he's trying to say, like, why aren't we talking about this? Do we even want this? Do we even know it exists? Do we care? Are, are, are we striving for anything? Are we trying to attain the greater things? Or are we content with the status quo? Do we care about the meat of the gospel? Or have we just grown accustomed to the milk? And so we don't talk about this. We ignore it. When was the last time you sat in a gospel doctrine class and you had an in-depth discussion about the sealed portion and what we need to do to get it? How we need to qualify for it as a people. What our unbelief is that is inhibiting us from qualifying for the greater things. I mean, can you solve a problem that you don't even, number one, know exists in the case of some members of the church, but number two, 
focus on, give your attention, try to come up with solutions for, try to remedy, right? Like if we don't talk about it, we can't fix it. So that's the second. So first one, DNC 84, we've treated lightly these things. The Book of Mormon, we're under condemnation. We have to remember the Book of Mormon to say and to do according to what it says. The second scripture that most Mormons ignore, 3 Nephi 26, 7 through 11, we just read that. There's lesser things and greater things, and we just read in Ether 4, relatedly, uh, that the brother of Jared's vision uh, comprises some of the greater things that Moroni was commanded to include but seal so that we can't have access to it. Okay, number three. This is DNC 93.6. So this says simply, this verse, and John saw and bore record of the fullness of my glory. This is the Apostle John. And the fullness of John's record is hereafter to be revealed. Well, what is that? When was the last time we talked about the fullness of John's record? Have you heard any you know, sacrament meeting talks recently about <laughs> the fullness of John's record? Have we, are we aware that there's more from John that we're waiting for? Well, interestingly, I stopped reading in Ether 4 before I got to the verse where Moroni talks about it. Actually, it's the Lord talking about it. So I read through verse 15. This is in Ether 4. So here's verse 16. So again, he's saying, uh, hey, you know, come unto me, Gentiles. I'll show you greater things. Come unto me, O house of Israel. I will, I'll show you these greater things that have been kept from you. So that's what the Lord is saying. That's what I already read. And then here in verse 16, what I didn't read. And then show my revelations, which I have caused to be written by my servant John, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember when you see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, that they shall be made manifest in very deed. So another kind of confirmation of this record from John that we don't have, that it's connected to this brother of Jared's vision, that John saw these amazing things that God wanted him to document to share with us. So then we go to 1 Nephi 14. And so here's Nephi talking about in verse 25, and 27, he says, well, I'll, I'll do 25 through 27. First Nephi 14. But the things, so here's the Lord talking to uh, Nephi. The things which thou shalt see hereafter, thou shalt not write. So Nephi is getting this vision. So the Lord is saying, don't write the things after right now. For the Lord God hath ordained the apostle of the Lamb of God that he should write them. This is John. God has ordained John that he should write these things. And also others who have been. To them hath he shown all things, brother of Jared, among others, presumably. And they have written them, and they are sealed up to come forth in their purity, according to the truth which is in the Lamb, in the own due time of the Lord unto the house of Israel. And I, Nephi, heard and bear record that the name of the apostle of the Lamb was John, according to the word of the angel. So we've got this amazing vision from John, this amazing vision from the brother of Jared, perhaps others as well. It's in the sealed portion. We're, it's, it's the fullness of John's record. It, it's there for the taking. It, it's there for the receiving, I guess we can say. But are we even asking for it? Uh, <laughs> do, do we think about it? Do we care? Do we, like, again, so we're under this condemnation and, like, everyone's kind of okay with that. And we just have this, like, benign, low-level uh, adherence to the primary answers of the gospel, as if those were ever sufficient. We all talk in, in our classes, oh, it's the primary answers. We got to read and we got to, you know, pray and we got to, you know, pay our tithing and all these things. And yes, absolutely. But yes, and. Right. Because the primary answers are insufficient to get us out from under condemnation. Primary answers have been part of this, the supposed solution for generations past of saints who were condemned as are we. And so it's got to be more than that. But how do we figure out what that is? And how do we work on it if we don't talk about it? So that's scripture number three, John's record, which relates to and leads us to number four. Sorry, my allergies are flaring up today. Second Nephi 28, 21. Now we're familiar with this verse. But I think we apply it to others instead of ourselves. And especially in this context of 
what I'm calling interrelated scriptures I've shared about the Book of Mormon and condemnation and the sealed portion and all these things. Here we are in 2 Nephi 28, 21, where it says, And others will the adversary pacify and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, All is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth. All is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. We apply to others that which is uncomfortable to apply to ourselves. I don't think most members of the church, when they read this verse, think that it applies to them. But I think it does, including myself. I'm, I'm not standing on a rammy umptum here. <laughs> I struggle with this too. But the point is, at least, like, it's one thing to struggle. It's, it's another thing to ignore. It's one thing to have a goal and not achieve that goal and be imperfect in, in achieving that goal. And that's kind of where I see my, myself, right? It's another thing to not even pay attention to the goal, right? To, to not focus on the sealed portion, to not think through the implications of the Book of Mormon, to not identify how we need to change our behavior and culture as, a, as it relates to what the Book of Mormon says that we should think and do and believe. And, and so I see a difference, right? So I'm not perfect here. I'm not saying that, but I will say at least I'm cognizant of these things. I'm aware of the condemnation. I focus a lot on on this or try and and I'm struggling and I'm not perfect and you know I've got my challenges here with with this type of thing too but I think we need more awareness of the goal so that we can be striving for it so I think in our culture and by culture I mean our church culture that we have a very strong prevalent mentality of all is well in Zion and I think we see it in the primary answers we see it in the milk toast application of the gospel in people's lives we see it in the, you know, I go to church on Sunday and I check out for the rest of the week. We see it in the compartmentalization of beliefs where people have their Sunday bucket and then they have the rest of their life in other buckets. And they don't apply the gospel standards to, you know, those economic and political and other decisions. We see it in all of these cases where people feel that largely all is well in Zion. That, you know, things will be all right. Okay, maybe we get beat with a few stripes at the end of the day, but we'll, you know, return to God, whatever. Like, I'm being a good Mormon. I'm being a good Christian. I'm, you know, checking the boxes. I'm a good person. I'm not, you know, sleeping around or committing adultery or or committing murder or anything. So I'm, I'm good. I'm a good person. Right? But that's relative. Compared to the muck we see in the world and, and watching social media and everything, you know, I, someone last night just sent me this whole mom talk crap that I guess is going on. Like, just there's so much garbage out there, right? That people are doing stupid things. And I won't even get off on that tangent. Probably shouldn't have even mentioned it. But people are doing all kinds of stupid stuff. So relative to stupid people doing stupid stuff, we might see ourselves as doing pretty good, Right. I bake cookies for my neighbors and I pay my tithing and I do service with my family and we go to the temple and, you know, we fulfill our callings. Awesome. So relative to the people who are doing horrible things, you're doing great. But you're being graded on a curve, right? It's like you're going to like fourth grade social studies class and, you know, you get an A because you're being graded on a curve doesn't mean you got every answer right. It just means you don't suck as bad as all the other students. And so if we evaluate our spirituality on a relative basis compared to other people, we, may, we might be great comparatively, but are we great in God's eyes? Are we rising to the standard that he has established? Are we really putting into practice the lesser things that we've received? It's not enough to just read the Book of Mormon, check it off our box, Check, check off the box. It's not enough to focus on just the happy-go-lucky, peace-Jesus stuff that's in the Book of Mormon, which is all essential, critical, and amazing. But it's not enough, right? The Book of Mormon is about way more than that. And the Lord has been warning us about how to not repeat the mistakes of two fallen societies. 
right? The Nephite Society and the Jaredite Society. President Hinckley had that great quote about the Book of Mormon being more inspired and inspiring than the morning newspaper and describing the, the lasciviousness and the heavy taxation and the political corruption and the secret combinations and all of these things that happen in both of these societies. And so we get to Ether Aid and Moroni is literally screaming from the pages saying, God is commanding you to wake up, to not let this happen to you to prevent it, to awaken to your awful situation, to see these things happening and do something about it. Are we? And, and that's a weird question because like maybe you are and you feel like, great, good for you. But I'm referring to the collective we, you know, in our church. And I don't think the institution or the culture is, is encouraging this analysis of these scriptures, our, our, you know, come follow me manuals and our primary manuals and our at home learning and all these things are covering so many important things in scripture, but I don't think that they're pointing us to these. And so it's, it's like we as a church have become acclimatized to and comfortable with our condemnation. We're, we're okay. We're fine. All is well in Zion. We're good. We got the lesser things. We got the restored gospel, lowercase r, lowercase g, right? But that's enough because it's more than others got. We, we've got more revelation than they do. We're good. And, and we basically rejected the fullness. We've, we've denied the more part of the gospel. We have become what it talks about in 4th Nephi 1, Right? Many churches which profess to know the Christ, and yet they deny the more parts of his gospel insomuch that they did receive all manner of wickedness, openly, willingly. I love our church. I love the church leaders. They are good people that mean well. This is not an indictment of any one person or of church leadership more broadly. It's an indictment of us. Right? Church leaders, in many cases, are the byproduct of the membership in which they were encultured and raised over the generations. Our modern church leaders have grown up under this condemnation, right? They've grown up in a church culture that doesn't talk about it, that, that sweeps it under the rug and says, no, all is well. Don't focus on the sealed portion stuff and don't focus on our condemnation. Let's focus on the things that will be pleasing unto us. Let, let's, let's heap unto our ears, you know, teachers that will profess that we're doing good things. And so that's our culture. And I think that's a problem. And I think, therefore, that we are denying the more parts of his gospel so much that we receive all manner of wickedness, as evidenced by last week's musing on idolatry. So again, like, I don't want to be preachy here and say, like, I know how to do all this. I know how to uproot this cultural bias gunk and the traditions of our fathers and things. Like, I struggle with all of that, you know? I mean, I watched Top Gun Maverick a couple nights ago. And the whole time I'm squeamish thinking, oh, this is military propaganda and there's, you know, gods of stone and steel that Spencer W. Kimball talked about. And <laughs> here's a glorified manifestation of, of, you know, Satan buying up armies and navies, you know, to dominate the world. But it was an amazing movie, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's tough, right? I, I struggle. I'm not perfect here. That My intent here is to never say that, like, I'm doing amazing at all this, but I do have the desire to improve. I do have the desire to talk about these goals, to recognize that they exist, to identify our gap and say how far off we are from where we should be. Not to be content with the status quo and to say all is well in Zion or to ignore all these things, but quite the opposite. I, I embrace the the discomfort of analyzing how far off we are because I want to talk about what we need to do to fix it. Right? I'm, I'm the type of person that's like very problem solution oriented. Let's identify the problem, come out with the solution, you know, and get going. I recognize not everyone is like that. I've had to learn by hard experience that not everyone thinks like that or appreciates that, but that's how I'm wired. And so I like talking about this. I wish we talked about it more, right? I wish we focused on our condemnation so that we could identify together how to get out from under it. Because until we do, we're stuck. Until we do, we remain condemned. We're missing out on so much more. How amazing would it be if, if we could get a little peek into the sealed portion and get access to like, you know, these Zion societies or these amazing revelations of what's to come. 
right? I mean, you read Revelation in the New Testament by John, and like there's four billion interpretations of what all the things mean, and it's confusing, and it's so symbolic and difficult to understand. But the clarity of what's in the sealed portion from John, the fullness, right? Like imagine what that would be like to help give us guidance on what we should be doing today, what we can expect of what's to come. But again, like we can see why God doesn't give us those things, because if we're not prepared to receive them, would we do anything about it? Or would it be an intellectual exercise? Ooh, the sealed portion. Let me let me flip through this and see what's in there, right? Ooh, curious. But if we're not going to do anything about it, why would God give it to us? If anything, it's a loving God that doesn't give it to us, because by doing so, we would be even more condemned because we're held accountable to the light and truth that we receive. And so God is being merciful to us by depriving us of something that we would be held accountable for. And so at what point are we collectively going to be at a point where we are prepared to receive that? I don't know what that answer is. Because in the church, we're at varying levels of gospel knowledge and fidelity and testimony. And so how can the church more broadly receive greater light and truth if we've got this like lowest common denominator right weighing us down or holding us back that's a kind of interesting question is the sealed portion only going to be restored to you know certain people is there going to be a different process is it going to be openly shared with the world is it after zion's been restored right because we have to be a more righteous people i don't know but it's very clear from the scriptures here that god wants us to receive it that he's told us how we can there's nothing in here that's conditioned on second coming or Zion or anything that I've read. And so have we just given up? It kind of feels like it. It, it feels like we believe all is well in Zion, largely speaking. And while we can have improvement at the margins, oh, we got to get our, our, our ministering, you know, improved and more fast offerings and, you know, more days of service and better food storage and all these things. It's, it's, it's hacking at the branches rather than striking at the root. God gave us this instruction manual. I, I believe the Book of Mormon is what Joseph said it was. There is no, I've shared before why I continue to believe in another musing. I find no other plausible explanation for the Book of Mormon. And I reviewed, I think, them all. I, I remain a, a believer in the Book of Mormon of what it purports to be. And I, I, I am frustrated in some sense that we as a church culture are not willing to fully believe and put into practice what's in the Book of Mormon. We've reduced it to this superficial fluffery, for lack of a better term, of, you know, things that we should read about Jesus and how we can improve our lives and the Holy ghost and all these good things, but we are denying the more parts of his gospel. We are avoiding the uncomfortable countercultural, controversial things in the book of Mormon. And by doing so we've treated it lightly by doing so we are repeating the mistakes of the past. We remain under the oppression of the secret combination we have not awoken to our awful situation. We're going through the same thing that the Nephites and Jaredites were when God intended us to stop that cycle by giving us the Book of Mormon, this warning manual. And so we've shrugged. We've said, eh, we're good. All's well in Zion. You know, as long as I raise a family and, you know, go to church and everything, we'll be good. And I, I, I think that's not the point. I think that is so far beneath the point beneath the standard that we should be rising to. And so how do you how do you encourage other people to rise to that standard? How do we get other people to think about this more, talk about this more? That's what I've been wondering. Is it studying the ark to, you know, be talking about and openly desiring this stuff? Is it giving meat to people who are only able to stomach milk? Am I if God is merciful by not giving us the the greater things because we would be held accountable to something we're not ready for? Am I creating problems by pushing this meteor doctrine and higher expectations onto people who aren't ready for it yet? Are there some people listening right now who are struggling with the milk of the gospel? And so by me openly talking about this meaty stuff, I'm actually doing them a disservice or spiritual harm. 
That to me is a very interesting question because again, how do you, how do you manage this broad range of spiritual status and, and get everyone to, um, to increase? I am reminded of this quote that I'm going to try and pull up on the fly from Joseph Smith. I found it. He says, this is 1844. I have tried for a number of years to get the minds of the saints prepared to receive the things of God. But we frequently see some of them, after suffering all that they have for the work of God, will fly to pieces like glass as soon as anything comes that is contrary to their traditions. They cannot stand the fire at all. How many will be able to abide a celestial law and go through and receive their exaltation? I'm unable to say, as many are called, but few are chosen. Here's Joseph with all these revelations, trying to get the saints to seek and desire and live according to more. And yet he says that as soon as anything comes that's contrary to their traditions, they'll fly to pieces like glass. Are we in a better state than the early saints were? I don't think so. I think we've got way more contrary traditions. I think we have way more idolatry today. And so we're kind of in this lull. I don't know the right word for it. We're in this 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 funk, this spiritual funk as a church. We're we're content with and uh the 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 status quo. We're content with the lesser things and we don't even acknowledge or discuss the existence of and how to obtain the greater things. I think that needs to change. I'm not the one to to do that. I don't know who is. Maybe I am. Maybe we are all of us, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? Maybe it's, we got to openly talk about this stuff more. We got to have deeper gospel doctrine discussions. Let's, let's get a bit more meaty. Let's help the, the, the people on the milk and lift them up. Like, I don't know how to do all that, but it's something I'm thinking about because these four sections of scripture, I think are completely ignored almost entirely. And to me, that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. <laughs> By ignoring these, we are perpetuating the problem. We are signaling that we're okay with communication, with the condemnation, excuse me. We are signaling that we are okay with the condemnation. And, uh, and I think thereby falling into the very trap that the Lord was trying to help us avoid or get out of by giving us the Book of Mormon in the first place. So where you go with that, I don't know, other than let's read the Book of Mormon some more. Let's actually figure out how to apply its message to our day. Let's appreciate what we've been given. Let's flood the earth with the Book of Mormon. But it's about more than Jesus. It's a warning manual. And if we ignore its secondary purpose, a fundamental purpose all of its own, then all of these things get triggered. We remain under condemnation. We don't get the sealed portion. We don't get the greater things, right? And and it all stems from how we have treated the Book of Mormon. Have a great Sunday.